Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the As a Woman podcast. I am your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you guys so much for all your support and love of the podcast. It's just a huge passion project of mine, and y'all have been with me through so much. I know there are so many episodes. Quick note, you can also search on my website, nataliecrawfordmd.com. If you go to the website, you will notice there's a resources page and at the top is a search bar. So if you are curious, oh, does she have an episode on this or on that? You can type it in the search bar and you will see actually all the more long form content that I have on that topic. So if you want to go put in PCOS, you can see YouTube videos, podcast episodes, or blog posts that all relate to PCOS. And I just think that is such a great way for you to maybe do a deep dive on a topic that you might be curious about that maybe I have some really awesome sauce episodes, but they're from four years ago. So just FYI, you can always go back and see episodes in the past. All right. Well, today I want to dive into talking about hysteroscopy, preparing for hysteroscopy, what it is and what you should know. So hysteroscopy is a form of reproductive surgery, and this is a type of surgery that your gynecologist surgeons, so whether it is your OBGYN, a minimally invasive GYN surgeon, or even a subspecialist like myself, reproductive endocrinologist, or potentially some other subspecialists may do. I will say that REIs, like me, this is, this is our surgery, meaning the inside of the uterus and optimization of the uterine cavity for implantation falls in our wheelhouse so strongly that I do the surgery more than anything else. And REIs tend to be the ones that do very complex uterine surgery. Now, that also said, there are some MIGs, which is minimally invasive gynecologic surgeons, and there are some of them who do extensive, amazing jobs at uterine surgery and some who focus more on robotic or laparoscopic approaches. So it's not a one-size-fits-all, and that can sometimes be hard if you fall into the position of needing hysteroscopic surgery. Who is going to do it? And the short answer is it depends. Hysteroscopy is a camera that goes into your uterus. Now, it does this by going through the cervix and into the uterine cavity. So it's a vaginal-based approach, and that means there's no incisions. You're not paralyzed throughout the surgery. It is a much less risky surgery than what you may think of in your brain as surgery. When we do hysteroscopy, the reasons to do it, one is diagnostic, meaning it is the absolute gold standard, best way to evaluate the inside of the cavity. And evaluating the inside of the cavity is a part of the normal fertility evaluation. And it's also a part of the evaluation for pregnancy loss or preparation for embryo transfer. And this is a step that often can reveal different things. So diagnostic means I don't have a known reason that something is wrong. I'm not going in preparing for something to be wrong but I'm just going to look. This might be done preemptively as a part of the diagnostic evaluation. It also might be done because something's not going right. Other reasons for hysteroscopy can include abnormal bleeding, which usually is tied into abnormal findings on an ultrasound. So things that can cause abnormal bleeding, and one example is a polyp. A polyp is a projection of endometrial tissue that's inside the uterus, Typically, a polyp is benign, but not always. And so polyps project into the uterine cavity. Now, polyps can cause inflammation inside that uterine cavity and can decrease implantation. 
not every polyp, it depends where and the size, but specifically if you're going through IVF and you're taking all this time and money, we 100% want to optimize that uterine cavity before we go put an embryo inside. Polyps notoriously can cause some spotting, intermenstrual spotting is one clue. So going to hysteroscopy for a polyp. Another reason could be a fibroid. So fibroids are a little bit different. A polyp, where if we think of it as a projection of that endometrial tissue, the lining, the inside portion of the uterus, a fibroid is a ball, it's a tumor, so it's a ball of cells. That's what a tumor is, an abnormal growth of a certain cell type, but it's of the muscular cell component of the uterus. So if we remember the uterine cavity, there's the innermost layer, that is the endometrium. There is the myometrial layer, the muscle, which is the bulk or the majority of the uterus. And then there's the serosa or the outside layer. Fibroids can be in all the different places. The ones I'm specifically talking about that you can operate on with hysteroscopy are the ones that are inside the uterine cavity. And these are called submucous fibroids, meaning they're in the innermost portion of the uterus or they are projecting into it. Sometimes fibroids that are partial submucous and invading into that myometrial later can also be operated on hysteroscopically. But a lot of fibroids are just deep in the myometrium or even on the outside of the cavity and not always can these be accessed from the inside of the uterus. Also, not all fibroids need to be removed. So we are removing most polyps, but for a fibroid, especially if it is not in or invading that inside of the uterine cavity, that endometrial layer, if they're not submucous or have a submucous component, we're often leaving them in place, which has been a change in the field. But so fibroids that are intramural, really in that myometrial layer, and certainly ones that are subserosal or on the outside of the uterus, we're actually leaving a lot of those in place and not taking them out. The exceptions here are if they are very large, if they're causing obviously other symptoms. I should clarify and say we're not taking them out for fertility. There's definitely a hundred other indications if you have really heavy bleeding, if you're needing blood transfusions, if you're having pain, if you're having bulk symptoms where those fibroids are so big, you look pregnant, it can cause a lot of discomfort. Those are definitely reasons why you might want fibroids removed separately. But if we're focusing on hysteroscopy and what we need to do for fertility or to help you get pregnant, then definitely the things that are inside the cavity need to be fixed. And that's what hysteroscopy is doing. We are tending not to remove some of those fibroids that are not in the cavity because you only have one uterus. And once you've cut all the way through it, you're introducing the risk for scar tissue. And I have seen this. People who've had a fibroid removed that is intramural and potentially didn't have to be removed and resultant had half their uterine cavity scarred. We've had people who then after having a big fibroid removal, you know, have a risk for uterine rupture with pregnancy and need a C-section. So it's not a benign surgery to go take out a fibroid, especially very large ones in somebody who still wants their uterus to function to carry a pregnancy because that's a big job. It has to grow, expand, hold the pregnancy, then contract and stay intact. So the take home here is that when we're talking about hysteroscopy or putting the camera into the uterus, we could do it for diagnostic purposes. We could do it to remove a polyp. We could do it to remove a fibroid. Next on the list is going to be scar tissue. So scar tissue can come from a variety of different reasons. The uterus has, if we think about that endometrium as the layer that regenerates and regrows and sheds, this is your menstrual blood. So this endometrial layer that you see is constantly regrowing and regenerating. And that layer actually has some stem cells coming from a basal layer right above it. And the reason why that is important is that basal layer can get damaged. And when it does, it loses the ability to regenerate the endometrium. And this is what facilitates the development of scar tissue. Scar tissue inside the uterus can be so damaging. 
and it can range from mild words like flimsy, thin, to dense, thick scar tissue. When the scar tissue takes over the majority of the cavity to the point where there really is no endometrium, you've now developed Asherman syndrome. And Asherman syndrome is an amenorrhea, a complete destruction of the uterine cavity. And then there's partial versions where there's a large portion of the uterine cavity, which has been taken over by scar tissue. You may have some bleeding, maybe it's light, depending on where the scar is and where there is still endometrium. And I've even had a patient who has endometrium trapped above where that scar tissue is. But uterine scar tissue you can go in and you can cut it. That is not hard. And that's what you do when it comes to hysteroscopy for scar tissue is you can go and you can resect or cut out the scar. The big question here is how do you prevent it from coming back? Because if that basal layer is damaged, it's just going to come back over and over. And I will tell you, everybody who does hysteroscopy or most people, especially if they deal with Asherman, have an approach. And my approach is going to be different than somebody else's. It doesn't mean that it's one isolated approach. But in general, I have an extensive post-operative protocol. So putting a balloon inside the uterus that is there for a week, trying to distend the cavity so those basal layers don't touch, antibiotics, high-dose estrogen, and really a month of hormone replacement trying to encourage that endometrial layer to grow over that area where the scar has been. And I'm always a big believer in an ultrasound afterward, a saline sonogram or repeat hysteroscopy to make sure that the scar is really gone depending on the severity. So you think diagnostic, polypectomy, removing a polyp, myomectomy, removing a fibroid, lysis of adhesions, removing scar tissue, and then we have Mullerian anomalies, which namely is a uterine septum. Hysteroscopy alone is only telling you about the inside of the cavity. So there are certain Mullerian anomalies, which are birth defects of the uterus, where hysteroscopy is not going to give you the full picture. So typically there's a diagnostic evaluation that happens ahead of time, whether it is with transvaginal sauno, 3D sauno, saline sauno, HSG, MRI, concurrent laparoscopy or camera at the abdomen because there are times where it can be hard if you're just looking at the inside of the uterus to know what's going on. And I know that confuses patients, but if we think about what Mullerian anomalies are is the uterus actually forms in two different buds. These buds elongate and fuse together and then the midline portion reabsorbs connecting the two cavities. These buds are the top one third of the vagina the cervix, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. So you can have failure at so many different parts. One bud can fail to grow completely and the other one looks good. You can have failure of connection, two separate uterine cavities. You can have connection and failure of reabsorption. And that could be complete failure or partial failure. You could have partial failure of fusion and partial failure of reabsorption. And so you have these Differing levels and types of birth defects that you can have of the uterus. And when you put the camera in, you're only seeing the inside of the uterine cavity and you're not seeing the outside. So you cannot always distinguish. So it's very important to know what you're doing before you just get in the uterus. And if you encounter something on hysteroscopy that you don't know, that you can't determine at the type of surgery, this very well may mean that the surgery is stopped, further investigation is undertaken, and you might have to go back to surgery later. But the most common type of birth defect that we are actually operating on nowadays is a uterine septum. A uterine septum is the most common type of uterine birth defect. This is where you had complete development of those Mullerian buds. They fused together completely, but you had failure of complete reabsorption of that midline connecting structure, leaving you with an avascular septum. This septum now dangles into the midline portion of the uterus, for lack of a better word, but that can prevent an embryo from coming in and being able to attach correctly. And so what we see is higher rates of miscarriage, specifically in the presence of a septum that corrects itself when the septum is removed. 
Now, septums are removed, and then depending on how broad it is, how deep it is, sometimes that also requires post-operative management like scar tissue does, and mainly with the idea that we don't want that area that you just resected to then develop a scar because it's the same problem but different. A vascular tissue that's a septum, if I cut it out and now I've replaced it with a vascular scar tissue, I haven't really helped. And I have seen people had a septum removed and then developed terrible astromans afterward. So that is certainly not the most common scenario, but a potential scenario. And so that's a septum resection. So all of these things potentially could be possibilities depending on what you're leading into the hysteroscopy knowing. So if your doctor is doing it as a part of your diagnostic evaluation for infertility, which again, they may do, you might actually have some of these other procedures done if they are found at the same time. So there's a situation where you're signing a consent form saying, yes, you could do X, Y, or Z because I'll be asleep and I can't consent at that time. There's also the circumstance where some people do in-office hysteroscopy, and so they don't have the operative capability of doing all of these things, but they're taking a look and getting a better idea, and then you might have to go to a full-fledged surgery if something is found. So let's review just preparing for the hysteroscopy, more detailed about what it is, what you should know, and the questions you should ask. So again, hysteroscopy is a surgical procedure. It is where a camera is placed through the cervix into the uterine cavity. The uterus is a potential space, meaning it's not open. Like that triangular picture you see in your brain, or if you go and Google uterus image, you see this triangle. That's not really what the uterus looks like. It is collapsed amongst itself and those endometrial layers are touching and it's day-to-day life. It expands like that when there's a pregnancy inside of it or anything that distends the walls since it is a potential space. So when you do hysteroscopy, what you're doing is putting that camera inside and it is connected to what we call a fluid management system, meaning two tubes are connected to the camera device and one brings water in and the other allows water out. So if you can imagine a circuit where water is going into the uterine cavity and then coming out. And the reason why you have this double flow is because if you are doing operative hysteroscopy, meaning more than just looking diagnostic, you might have some blood and you want to get that blood out of the uterine cavity so you can see what is going on. Visualization of what is happening is one of the issues with hysteroscopy because if everything's dark or bloody or you can't see well, you can't operate well. This is why people are very picky about when they might do hysteroscopy in your cycle. And by people, I mean me. So if I'm going to do hysteroscopy, I will do it in three scenarios. One, you have amenorrhea. You are not bleeding, and I know you have a very thin uterine lining. So it's not that you're not bleeding with a super thick lining. You have a very thin lining. Two, you're on birth control pills. Birth control pills are ethanol estradiol and a progestin. This daily progestin prevents extensive growth of the uterine lining. That's why a lot of people like the pill because they now have lighter bleeding, lose less blood, less anemia, less cramps. But for hysteroscopy, I'm a bad analogy girl. Y'all know this. So I tell patients, if I'm going to hysteroscopy and I want to take a polyp out, let's relate it to I have a tree stump in my yard and I need to get the tree stump out. And if the grass is all really tall and hasn't been mowed for weeks, I may not be able to remove all of the tree stump because it will be hard to see where the base of it is. However, if I go in and I have freshly mowed the grass, now I can see really great, get the tree stump, and it's no longer a problem for me. So if you're on birth control pills, it's like keeping the grass mowed. The other option is right after your period. So in the follicular phase, this is a very small window where after you're done bleeding, but before you have ovulated, and really it's before you get closer to ovulation when that uterine lining is really thick and fluffy preparing for implantation because it's hard to see then. So this is that late follicular phase. It's typically days six to 11. So 
is quite specific. Okay, so that is a very small window when you can do the surgery because you want to be able to see. If you are actively bleeding and it's the day of your surgery, you should let your doctor know. Nobody wants to put you through anesthesia, show up, be NPO, meaning nothing by mouth, and show up and then have your surgery canceled. So if you're actively bleeding, you should tell your team because they may change the surgery date you want your doctor to be able to see. This is also a reason why if they tell you to take the birth control pill, you should A, take it, or B, have a conversation that you don't want to, or what else can you do? And I have these conversations with patients all the time. I mean, what will make me mad, y'all, is if you say, sure, I'll take the pill, and then we show up to your surgery day and you tell me, oh, I didn't like that, so I didn't take it. Because now I'm probably set up to operate on the wrong day, the wrong time. I'm not going to be able to do as good of a surgery. You've taken time off work. So has your person who's driven you there. And we are just not set up for success. And I am an OCD girly who wants to be set up for success. And I promise all your surgeons are. So honesty is the best policy here. You may or may not get certain instructions. So Nothing by mouth after midnight is a pretty common one. This is an anesthesia requirement because we don't want you to aspirate, which can happen. In general, this is not a full-on crazy intense anesthesia because we're not doing abdominal surgery. Exception, little star exception here is if you're having concurrent laparoscopy. Oh, you're having surgery to see about your endometriosis and they're also doing hysteroscopy at the beginning of it. That's a different scenario. But if you're just coming in for hysteroscopy, it is a relatively mild anesthetic because you don't have to be paralyzed as extensively really at all. And you do, if somebody's operating your abdominal cavity, that's a whole different ball game. So when we are doing this, it's usually nothing to eat after midnight. We don't want you to aspirate. That's where you almost regurgitate your stomach contents, like you vomit. And then you swallow it into your airway, like you breathe it into your airway and people can get a terrible pneumonia, very, very, very sick from that. So nothing to eat after midnight. You'll have a time to come. You'll get an IV. You'll talk to anesthesia. They'll get you prepped. You'll have to answer some questions. You should see your surgeon. There'll be a consent form to review. You may or may not have gotten a medication to prepare you for the surgery. So this could be an oral antibiotic. It could be mesoprostol, which is a cervical dilation medication. And this is something I love, love. It can cause some cramps. So you might be instructed to take it the night before, the morning of. And what it is doing is starting to ripen the cervix. It's actually used in labor to soften and open up the cervix. And if we do this before hysteroscopy, it is a lot easier to get the camera in without having to dilate the cervix up. And ultimately that decreases the risks because if somebody is dilating the cervix, that's a blind part of the procedure. There is the potential for risk versus if I can get you to have your cervix ripened, meaning it's soft, it's a little bit open, and I can just put my camera through, that's direct visualization. And that's my preference. But if you are prescribed mesoprostol, it can cause some cramping. It is important to take it. Make sure you follow the instructions. It's usually placed vaginal in this scenario. So just make sure you know what you're doing. You'll get there. You'll talk to everybody the day of the surgery. You'll get your IV. You'll roll back to the operating room. I'm a believer that it's important to know what is happening. So if we are doing or the plan is for a polyp, that is typically micro instruments. So we are putting in very small little scissors and graspers, cutting the base of the polyp, pulling it out, and often sending it off to pathology. If we are doing a fibroid, it is sometimes these little micro instruments, but often it can be what we call a morselating instrument. So it is very cool. It actually is this little instrument that goes through the camera sheath. These cameras have an operative port where you place these little tiny instruments through and the instrument is so small has this very long tiny wire that it's attached to and then there's a handle on the end that is almost like a lever that you open and close but the actual operative part is millimeters it's so small all right so we have these tiny instruments which we use a lot 
for a fibroid, you have an instrument that actually can be more attached to the camera that can cut and suck those fibroid pieces out. And that can be very helpful if it's a larger fibroid. For septums and scar tissue, we tend to use our micro scissors for that portion of the procedure. So all of this is contained within the hysteroscopy device. The surgery typically is going to take, we'll say 20 minutes to 50 minutes, depending on the scenario or how extensive the situation is. We, again, are circulating that fluid through so that we can see the best. Your surgery could get stopped because one, you can't see. So you might be operating, you just can't see anymore. Nothing you do clears it up. And you say, I have to stop this. And maybe we have to come back for another look or look with further imaging in the office to see if we got everything. Your surgery may be stopped if you have fluid overload. This is much less common than it used to be, but in big surgeries, especially big fibroids, it's a potential thing. This is where as you're cutting into that uterus, your uterine blood vessels absorb some of that water that you're using in the uterus and that water gets into then your vasculature and it dilutes your blood too much and you can get water overload. So the nurses are typically measuring how much water is going in and out. So you could have the surgery halted for what we call fluid overload. And then a surgery could be stopped if you're not tolerating the anesthesia, but the most common reasons are can't see, lack of visualization, or fluid overload. Those are reasons why you might leave the surgery and hear that you have a different type of follow-up, whether it's a repeat surgery or something else. That's not common. I will say 95% of the time, this goes exactly like it should. Uterine surgeries are really quite fun. A uterine septum is my, oh, I love it. It's just very nice. You see this cavity in these two different pieces and you take these scissors and cut out the septum and it's so rewarding. So uterine surgery usually goes like really nice when it's done by hysteroscopy. As I said at the beginning, not every surgeon does every single type. So as an REI, I do all types of hysteroscopy. Your OBGYN does a lot of polyps and fibroids. They may or may not do septums or scar tissue just depending on their comfort level or the severity of it. And there are some circumstances where insurance is bonkers and it will cost you more to have a surgery with me than your OB, which we can debate insurance all day, every day. But in that scenario, sometimes I'll talk to your OB and say, hey, they have a fibroid. I think it might be cheaper with you if you want to take the case. The surgeries that you want to know if this is the right person is going to be a septum and scar tissue. Those are things that you want to understand the approach because the risk of complications afterward could potentially be higher. And really what I mean by higher is development of scar tissue or more scar tissue. So then I think it's best if you're going into the surgery, if you know what surgery they're planning to do, what's going to happen beforehand, what's going to happen afterhand. So if we have a scar tissue septum situation that I know is going to be bad, or I anticipate being severe, or I anticipate needing some of this hormone management, we're going to go ahead and prescribe you medicines afterward and talk through what the situation will look like. There are times I don't know. And so a lot of times I tell somebody, hey, I will let you know after the surgery. And I write down a novella of instructions, send you messages, the nurses will call because often I don't know how bad it is until we are in there. I am a believer. I like to be prepared. It's not wrong to do diagnostic hysteroscopy and figure it out as you go. I really like saline sonogram. So in office, Water ultrasound sounds very familiar. Speculum in the vagina, catheter to the cervix, fill the uterus with water as an idea of what's happening at surgery so that my brain is ready for a polyp, a fibroid, scar tissue, or septum. Again, we might be looking at these because you have symptoms. Maybe you have abnormal spotting and it's a polyp or heavy periods and it's a fibroid. Or you have lack of periods and it's scar tissue. Or you have a current miscarriage and it's a septum. So maybe there is a clinical symptom, but sometimes there is not, and we are going to surgery anyway. So do we know what the surgery is? What is our best expectation of what is happening? Preoperatively, what are my instructions? Postoperatively, what are we expecting? And what is the follow-up? Do I need to have a balloon in my uterus? Am I taking a certain type of medication or hormones? Am I taking estrogen? Am I continuing the birth control pill? Am I calling when my period starts? Do I need a repeat surgery? Do I need repeat imaging? Are you going to do another saline sonogram? 
to make sure things are good before proceeding. And again, there's no right or wrong. It 100% depends on the patient scenario and really what we're trying to accomplish and what treatment we're trying to get into. Lastly, y'all, like the vagina to the uterus, we are going from a not sterile place to a more sterile place. And your uterus, if your tubes are open, that fluid will exit your fallopian tubes and get into your peritoneal cavity. So we don't want you to have an infection. You might get antibiotics at the time of procedure. You might get antibiotics afterward. You will definitely have a cleaning of your vagina. Usually it's an iodine-based prep, but it can be different if you're allergic to iodine, shellfish, shrimp. You need to talk to your team, make sure they know that. But I say afterward, no intercourse, no swimming in like lakes, oceans, really pools or sitting in baths of water be and nothing per vagina, no tampons, etc. Because we have operated there and there's still some connection and we don't want you to get an infection. So I usually say those things for a couple of weeks. Your doctor might give you different recommendations. I am notably conservative because one pelvic infection post-operatively in one person is too many for me, but you want to understand what is your follow-up? Are there medications to take? Are there restrictions? Are we going to re-image or re-look? And when do I need to contact the clinic again? So often I hear of people who go and have a surgery or a procedure of any kind, and then they have no idea what to do next. And I hate that. So what is my next step? That is always what you need to know. And then the last thing I'll say is that you can be an advocate for yourself. So if you've never had imaging, whether it's saline sonogram, HSG, or a hysteroscopy of your uterine cavity, and you've been trying to conceive, we don't know what we don't know. And a lot of those things, I gave you their most common symptoms, but some of them are asymptomatic and really can impact your ability to get pregnant. So this is a part, the inside of the uterine cavity is a part of the basic fertility workup. If you are going to go to IVF because of a different reason, your partner doesn't have sperm or you are on a genetic testing or the length of your infertility, it just makes sense. You might delay the evaluation of the uterine cavity until after IVF, and that is fine, but it should be done before an embryo is put inside. Polyps, fibroids, birth defects, those are just things you cannot control. You can't control scar tissue either, but there are certain risks for it. So if you have had instrumentation of your uterine cavity, you've had a DNC procedure, especially in the context of heavy bleeding or postpartum, retained placenta, heavy bleeding after giving birth, second trimester loss and the placenta wouldn't come out, perforation of the uterine cavity, those things are high risk for developing scar tissue. Those things should be red flags if suddenly you now have irregularity, lighter periods, or absence of periods, you should get them evaluated. This can be very hard in the postpartum time period because if you're breastfeeding, you might have lactational amenorrhea and you're not ovulating, so you don't have a period. But eventually, especially when your child starts to have solids introduced, you should start ovulating again. And if you are past that six-month mark, and you don't have any periods at all, especially if you have ovulatory symptoms, meaning if you notice every month your boobs are starting to hurt and maybe you feel a little crampy or you feel that pms but no blood is coming out, please call your doctor. That right there to me is a red flag and something that I always wish I could see patients a little bit earlier on that spectrum. Asherman's on this list in my mind is the worst. It is not always fixable. I feel like most of the others are almost always fixable. Asherman's can sometimes be that scenario where somebody's having so many uterine surgeries that it's even hard to count. And there's times where people have to end up using a gestational carrier because the uterus has been damaged so much that it just can't be fixed. Ultimately, hysteroscopy is a safe procedure. There are very few real risks and the complications are minimum. So when I say the word surgery, I know that's really overwhelming, but this is a scenario where I like doing it in a surgery center so that I have everything available to me 
but it can be done in the office. It is ultimately so safe. So not something to worry about. Definitely something that if you're having recurrent implantation failure, recurrent miscarriages, not having success, having infertility, want to think about has your uterine cavity been evaluated and when should you ask for potentially a hysteroscopy, even if things have looked good on saline, because you're not having success and that ultimately is the gold standard. I hope this helped you understand a little bit about hysteroscopy more. Again, it's the only surgery I do now. I don't do abdominal surgeries. I don't do laparoscopy anymore. And I love hysteroscopy. So this is still when I am operating what I am doing. I tell my patients that I take your uterus very seriously. You only have one and we really want to make sure that we are treating it with kindness and doing everything we can to give that embryo a good home. All right, I'm going to answer some of your questions. So this is for Fertility Sake, your weekly Q&A, where I answer some of the questions that you ask on Instagram. These questions you can ask on Monday at Natalie Crawford, MD. You can also call and leave a voicemail. We have a voicemail episode coming up, and these are my favorite, where you ask your questions and I will answer them. 657-229-3672 is the voicemail number. You can leave your name or not. It doesn't matter. 657-229-3672. And again, I love it. My favorite episodes ever, ever are the fertility Q&A. And in my dream world, every podcast episode would be that. I mean, at some point I'm going to run out of things to talk about, right? But call and leave a voicemail or ask a question on Monday at Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Those questions are also answered in the newsletter, which you can sign up for nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. All right. The first question is my doctor prescribed Famara for recurrent pregnancy loss, but what is this helping? I have a good AMH and a good antral follicle count. I am new to this world. So Famara is also letrozole, and these are medications that are commonly used for ovulation induction. Ovulation induction means to make you ovulate when you are not. In an already ovulatory person, sometimes these medications can be used to help with some type of ovulatory dysfunction or for super ovulation. Femara or letrozole, they work by decreasing the estrogen that is circulating your blood. Therefore, your brain senses that there's a drop in estrogen and sends out an increased signal of FSH. FSH, again, is follicle-stimulating hormone, and that's the hormone that stimulates your body to grow an egg. So, The thoughts on how this potentially could help with recurrent pregnancy loss is one, could there be some luteal phase defect, which is the earliest stage of ovulatory dysfunction? If I get you to ovulate a better egg, because the follicle that ovulates is the follicle that becomes the corpus luteum, which makes progesterone. So versus adding progesterone on for recurrent loss, sometimes, and I'm a believer of this, if there's any, especially short luteal phase or spotting or weirdness in your period, getting you to ovulate a better follicle might get you to then have a better corpus luteum, which makes more progesterone, therefore helping you get or stay pregnant. The other thought is that if you're older, if I'm using it for super ovulation, because that FSH signal maybe now is stronger and instead of ovulating one egg, maybe you ovulate two or three, I am now having more genetic opportunity for a normal egg to be released. Remember that it's totally random. If you're older, most of your eggs are going to be abnormal and we don't control which egg the sperm fertilizes. So I don't love that strategy as much. I definitely do try it, especially if I think there's some potential luteal phase or mild ovulatory dysfunction. But that is generally what we are doing if somebody's considering ovulation induction agents in the spectrum of recurrent loss. Can you get pregnant with one fallopian tube after removal due to an ectopic? You can, and I have a whole recent YouTube video on this. Ultimately, the tubes are dynamic. They move around. They really, both tubes and ovaries sit behind the uterus and most people. And so if you have lost one tube, the other tube can definitely still grab the egg from an opposing ovary. The caveats here are that You could have scar tissue and that could make it harder if the tubes or the ovaries are stuck in certain places. And depending on like what potentially caused you to have the ectopic, was it random, which it can be, is there underlying endometriosis or damage from prior sexually transmitted infection of which the other tube may also be impacted. We do see, especially in ectopic pregnancies after removal of one tube, a 
lowering of pregnancy rates, but it's still ultimately high, meaning a lot of people will still get pregnant, but it's not as high as if you had two tubes. So it does decrease your fecundability some, but you definitely can still get pregnant with just one. What is it about PCOS or having a high AMH that makes it hard to conceive? So true, true, and unrelated. A high AMH is caused when you have a high follicle count. This is a part of the problem with PCOS, but not everybody with a high follicle count has PCOS. So if you have a high AMH, very regular periods, no symptoms of high testosterone, no extra hair growth, no acne, no hair loss, no insulin resistance, you might not have PCOS. If you have some of those, the irregularity of the periods, the androgen symptoms, and the high AMH, high follicle count, that puts you into that PCOS category. When we have PCOS, the shortest answer is what is happening is that the brain is sending out that regular amount of FSH, but it is getting diluted amongst too many follicles. When you have a high AMH, you have a high number of eggs inside the vault. That means a high number of eggs are coming out every month. So you have more eggs, same amount of FSH. Therefore, you don't have an egg responding because that FSH gets diluted. When that FSH is diluted, you either might have delayed response, as in it takes a follicle a long time to see enough FSH to ovulate, or you just don't ovulate at all, and those eggs die and another group comes out. The ovary gets super bored because it wants to do stuff, and so it starts making testosterone or those androgen hormones. And to add insult to injury, every little follicle that comes out of the vault makes a tiny amount of estradiol. So if somebody has 20 follicles outside the vault, their baseline estrogen let's just say is 20. And if somebody has 50 follicles coming out of the vault, their baseline estrogen's going to be 50 to 60. That differing estrogen feeds back to the brain. So if you have a higher resting baseline estrogen because of PCOS, the brain then is not going to send out as strong of an FSH signal the next time. So you get into this pathway where it does become hard to ovulate. And that's the main reason why PCOS impacts fertility is based on ovulatory dysfunction. So we can try to overcome this with those oral ovulation induction medications. Famara letrozole is drug of choice for PCOS patients. Clomid is an older medication that we sometimes use for ovulation induction, but not first line for PCOS anymore. But there's also metabolic downstream changes that also can make it hard to get pregnant. So once you develop insulin resistance, that can also make it difficult Gaining weight, which is often associated with PCOS, can cause inflammation, and that can make it difficult. So it turns into more, especially the longer it goes on. And PCOS can be very hard to diagnose, as all women's diseases can. Okay, y'all. Hope that helped. As always, thank you so much for your support of the As A Woman podcast. If you have questions for fertility sake, you can ask on Mondays on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can call the As A Woman voicemail. 657-229-3672. Thank you all for listening to As A Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman.